The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're working on the super glue gun. What have we done so far and what do we need to do? Well, I mean, we have it pretty much working as a mechanical glue gun. It has a temperature sensor, hot end, and DC motor. But what I want to do today is add the killer feature, which is the touch control auto stand. Awesome. So as soon as your finger touches the trigger, not pulls, it just touches it, so it's going to need to be a capacitance sensor, the stand pops out or goes back in. So how do we do it? Well, Felix, we need to A, figure out how to mechanically make the stand pop in and out, B, figure out how to actuate that, either with a DC motor or a servo, then C, make some code for the microcontroller to control that. If it's a servo, for instance, we need to create a timer library with interrupts. And then finally, D, figure out a way to put a capacitive touch sensor on the trigger that can be read by the microcontroller. Awesome. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired Designs. Imhotep's Priests. Regrettable Acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. What if uh, you had the, like a motor or whatever mechanism or mechanical, electromechanical device back here and you had some rods in the side and it pushed them out from back there. So we just have two rods that come out? Yeah. That's not a bad idea. Hey, grab some brass, we could bend that up. So then we have the actuator back here where we have more room. That's what you're getting at? Yeah. But we still have to load the glue sticks. And remember, they'll right. kind of like be a trough going into that. And I kind of forgot that we have all the electronics in the... Uh... I, like, I mean, I like the idea of the two rods, though. Of course, how would we move them? Would we have like a rack and pinion? Or? Maybe instead of rods, it could be like some sort of a piece that has feet out on this end, and then maybe the rack and pinion over here. I mean, the really obvious idea, you know, some of them have like the uh, rotating clip stands. Mm -hmm. Like to have the stand right here and then have it rotate out, like with a servo, but that would bulk up a lot of space here, mm -hmm. and also you'd have the servo really close to the hot end that I just touched for some reason. That's ah, only like a couple hundred degrees. I mean, I like this because it moves the mechanics to the back, but you know, it causes, it causes other problems that we'd have to solve. Is there room for a motor or a servo right here? Possibly. Oh yeah, maybe we could put like a... Well actually, yeah, maybe we don't even need the bend to be that far back. Maybe we just have it be like right there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, the trigger's there, which means we need th that much clearance for the finger because you need to wrap it around. You don't want to snake it through. Unless we had like kind of a trigger guard thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that could build into it, like right there. Of course, one problem with the rod is like, you know, someone might get poked with it, you know? Yeah, like, oh no, my kids got poked with the oh, rod. Geez. So maybe it's, you know, it's actually got an end to it. Yeah. I mean, I guess it wouldn't really matter. So it's almost like you have a piece like this, like a elongated rectangle, like a, almost like a metal tube. Wouldn't necessarily have to be brass rod either. Right. Like if this was just a flat piece of material, well, I mean, the most obvious way to do it would be to have teeth there and then have basically a rack and pinion with a motor. Mm -hmm. So this would be a gear that would drive the teeth and you'd have this on some sort of linear slide, which makes it go forward and back and then probably some sort of limit switch so you know where it is. Okay, so Karen had an old guitar laying around, so we hooked up a guitar string to this brass piece that represents the stand, and then we've got it hooked up to a really small servo here. And the idea is um, a uh, stranded steel uh, cable could go underneath the motor and all the extruders, and that could be the actuator. That would allow us to put the um, servo motor further back where it would be, um, where it would have more space and also not get overheated by the hot end, and then still control the stand in the front using a cable. Very much like how things work on your car. All right, cycle it, Felix. Go forward again. So it's a lot better at pulling than it is pushing, which means we need a stiffer rod. Yeah. Fun fact, if your servo is making noise, like 
right? It shouldn't make noise when it's not moving. If it is, that means it's trying to achieve a position it cannot reach and it will eventually burn itself up. I mean, the servo is um, like a motor with a potentiometer on it. So it's like, oh, I know where I am in degrees and I know where I have to be and I have to get there. Little servos like this aren't smart enough to know that, oh wait, I'm under strain. I clearly cannot achieve my position. I should stop trying to get there. They'll just keep trying to get there until they burn up their motor or their circuits because there are circuits inside of it or they will uh, strip the gears. Okay, this basic concept seems to work. I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna remake the um, brass stand here and I'm gonna make this uh, radius a little smaller because this obviously takes up a lot of space that we don't want to necessarily use. We want to have the you know end of the gun be pretty compact. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to rig up a smaller radius piece and we'll try it again. Okay, um, Felix suggested that we bend up the contact point. So we angled this up a little bit. So even if the wire doesn't push all the way forward, it should get all the way back. Good. Go forward again. That works great. That's a winner win a chicken dinner. See, the angle of the wire can only get so low, but if we tilt this up, that means the contact point is at the end of the wire, which means it can push that far. Because the wire can't lift, all it can do is push. All right, so we just gotta modify the stop blocks on the other extremity, not a big deal. And then, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so we need a servo on this AT Tiny 20. I was looking at a servo library from GitHub created by Free000. Well, anyway, uh, it looks like this person is, you know, calling an interrupt, and then every time the interrupt's called, it does a counter to see if the timer is past the point where the servo should be on or off, and then it turns it on and off. So I was like, okay, that's that's a good place to start. I don't need really that many servos. I just need one servo, so I don't need to create a whole bunch of objects. So I was looking at the timers and stuff. Now we're already using uh, timer zero to control the motor, so we have to use the other timer, which is timer one. But I was looking into how to set up the bits for this and was a little confused. So here is the chip diagram. Now timer zero is on PB2 and that's the motor PWM control. Now it's pretty easy just to toggle a pin. See how we have OC1A on PB1? That's an output compare pin for timer one. So check this out. We have uh, timer one register and we've set that. And you have to kind of combine these bits together to make this work. So that is blah, 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 blah. Timer A, blah, blah, blah. So we're doing zero one, which is toggle the pin every time the timer reaches a compare max. So a timer starts at zero and it counts up and once it hits the set number, in this case, we have it set to 50, it will toggle that pin. But we also have to think about the prescaler. So the prescaler is how fast the timer works in the first place. So we have our prescaler set to 64, which is the two LSBs. Now this is the part that confused me. It's the waveform generation mode. That's what actually gets, you know, generated by the timer. And we're using PWM 8-bit for our motor controller, which is 001 right here. Here's the wacky thing. It's split up. Those four bits are split up over it two bytes. So we have register A, the two LSBs of register A, or least significant bits, are the first two characters. And then the upper two are here. So if we want CTC clear timer on compare, which is what we want, it's 0100. So we have to put 01 into register B here and then 00 into register A here. Isn't that confusing? Okay, so we have that here. So here's 0100. And right now we're gonna have uh, set to toggle the pin every time it executes. So we divide by 64. So let's make this zero. So we'll see divide by 64. I'm gonna send it over. Okay, so on the scope, we see we have a square wave with a frequency of 61.5 kilohertz. So if you think about that, that is eight megahertz divided by 64, 125,000 hertz. But remember, this is frequency, so every time it executes, it's toggling the bit. The frequency detects the high pulses, so it's, the frequency is going to report as half of the actual frequency of the timer. Okay, we have the speed of the chip, which is eight megahertz, divide it by our prescaler that we set of 64. Okay, so that gives us a frequency of 61.5, which sounds wrong, but the thing you need to think about is it's toggling that line 125,000 times a second. And the oscilloscope considers the frequency to be 
when it's high. So the frequency on the scope is actually gonna report at 50% of the actual frequency that's being fed. I mean, the, the real frequency that you need to think about is how many times it changes, not how many times it's high. So that is correct. Okay, now let's make this trigger an ISR, interrupt service routine. Okay, so we have an ISR set, which says interrupt service routine, triggered on timer one, compare A. Okay, that's what we're, what we're doing. Execute this code here. And then we have the function here. All it's gonna do is toggle the, uh, the pin. We're actually toggling a different pin. We're not toggling the pin connected to that timer. We're toggling whatever pin we want, in this case, port A. That is how a servo library can control any pin you want, even if that pin isn't particularly set to a timer function. Okay, so we need to do a few things differently. Uh, let's set this back to 64 prescaler, and then we need to use the uh, timer interrupt mask register. So TIMSK. So we need this one. If we set that bit, then the interrupt will be enabled for that timer. So what you can do actually, is you can look on your data sheet, get the name of the bit, copy it, go into your code here, and I can say timsk equals one bit shift that value. So this is actually, you know, known by Atmel Studio to be something, or you can start typing it in, O-C-I-E, and then look, there it is. Cool, all right, so we're going to enable int on this timer. All right, after we set up the T-I-M-S-K bit, we have to do S-E-I function, which enables interrupts. And then in order for this to actually compile, we have to include the interrupt library as well. Uh, now it should do something on the scope. Let's take a look. This is gonna be a really short pulse every time the interrupt happens. So this is the pin being toggled, but then every time that timer executes, it also does a very short pulse. And this short pulse shown here in green is actually what's happening in the interrupt code, which is what we want. All right, so yeah, that's happening uh, at the same frequency, which is good. So I'm going to go back over here and uh, I'm gonna set the timer to normal mode. So this is toggling the pin. We don't want that because we wanna use that pin for other things. So we just clear that out to zero, zero. So I guess that register is just a bunch of zeros and that should get rid of the upper pulse and just leave us with the lower interrupt pulse there. Cool. Okay, now I'm gonna put some code into the interrupt service routine that will put different pulse lengths onto the servo and make it work correctly. All right, so we have a prescaler of 64. So we take 8,000 divided by 64, that gets us 125,000 um, calls to the ISR, interrupt service routine, per second. And here's what happens in the interrupt service routine. There are multiple states. So the first state is wait for high. That's when we turn the pulse high. So we set the pin high, then we wait for uh, 60 uh, counts which is approximately 512 microseconds. And then we set the state to the next state. Once the counter reaches 60 again, the interrupt service routine will be called again. Then we go to the next state. Now we're gonna set it to pulse ticks. Pulse ticks is what we actually want to set our servo to. Um, I was looking online, uh, you know, the, the spec for a servo is like 1000 microseconds to 2000 microseconds, but actually the range is more like 500 uh, microseconds to so 2,500 microseconds. And without having that full range, I wasn't able to get this servo to work, so I broadened it. Okay, so this is basically how long it's going to stay high past the min minimum. And on our scope here, you can see we have a frequency of 50 hertz, which is what we want. And right now the pulse is uh, 2.1 milliseconds or 2,100 uh, microseconds. Okay, then once this amount of time passes, we go to the next state which is wait for low. We make it go low right there. Then we pad out the rest of the time. So 255 minus pulse ticks. So pulse ticks can be set from zero to 255. So it's like if you have a short amount, then you need to pad it out with what's left. Or if you have a long amount, you also have to pad it out with what's left. And if, if you don't do that, then your timing won't be uh, consistent. So the starting pulses should always be 20 milliseconds apart or frequency of 50 Hertz, same thing. Uh, then we go to the next state, which is wait for loop. We're basically dividing everything up into packets of 512 microseconds. We have to wait 17.5 milliseconds. However, we can't count that high. So what we did was we divided it and we made it 35, which is 17.5 uh, divided by 0.5. 
And so basically we count uh, 35 iterations of 512 microseconds and that gets us back around to the next pulse and then we start it all over again. So basically we're using a state machine to make the pulses go high and low. That allows us to do the change on any pin, not necessarily the pins that are directly tied to the timer counters. All right, so now we can drive our little servo. So this is in, uh, well, let's just uh, do like a little loop here. So we'll do that and we'll delay thousand. Now maybe 2000 is better. Uh, yeah, 20 to 220. That's not degrees, that's um, interrupt pulses, but it should all add up. Let's see if it works. Sending it over. Seems like it's having a little bit of trouble getting to 220. I'm gonna knock it back to 215. There we go, that sounds better. Now if you look at the scope, you'll see the pulses are changing as well. So there's the low end and the high end. So this is, you know, the very definition of pulse width modulation. We're changing the width of the pulse and the servo reacts to it. But it's always at a set frequency, in this case, 50 hertz. Okay, well that gives us um, servo control using an interrupt without affecting our other timers that we're using for PWM control of the motor. So that just leaves the Q-Touch controller, the libraries I downloaded earlier that allow us to use a capacitance touch on one of the pins, and we'll use that to actually control this. So like if you're touching the trigger that's hooked up to one of these pins, the Q-Touch library then tells the servo where to go. So that's the last piece of this puzzle. Well, Felix, we managed to accomplish everything that we set out to do in this episode. Hey, that's awesome. What is next on our list? Well, now that we have a touch sensor working and the servo and a pretty good idea of how to mechanically actuate the stand, I'm gonna take those things and build it into the next iteration of the physical glue gun. Sweetness. Well, that's all the time we have for today. What do you think about our glue gun project thus far? Are there any cool features you think we should add? Leave your comments in the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. So just like glue, stick around. Kind of like uh, Jupiter falls from the sky. Uh, yeah, or yeah. Or goes up to the sky or something. So, I've enjoyed a little chit chat, but now it is your time to die. Okay, I'm gonna plot a course to the Galapagos Islands. All right. In like the 1800s. You're a worm gear. Your mom's a worm gear. I didn't know that. You should. Show us what you got. This week I want to find a capacitive touch sensor library for the AT Tiny so we can make a new trigger with a little metal plate in it so when your finger touches it, that's when the stand retracts or extends. So by the end of this episode, I want our glue gun to be like vroom, 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 vroom. Uh, I'm a fancy person holding a teacup. We're using up quite a bit of this chip's capability. I'm going to hot glue together the hot glue gun. It doesn't work.